Hey, today's episode is going to be a special one. Because we'll get to the news in a minute, but I have something really exciting to tell you today. The paper's been around for 150 years, and this project I'm about to tell you about, it's the first of its kind that we've done ever. So, some context. At The Crimson, we publish a special type of story called The Scrutiny. It's a more than 3,000 word cover story published weekly by 15 Minutes Magazine about Harvard. Scrutinies are a big deal. They've been featured in the Washington Post and are some of the Crimson's most deeply reported investigations. And this one, it's the first one ever written and produced for audio. It's about a serial mail bomber who for 17 years sent dozens of bombs all over the nation. Family homes, passenger planes, parking lots. He was a Harvard alum, came to Harvard at age 16, and the target of a nearly two decade nationwide manhunt by the FBI. Okay, I'll get out of your way. From 15 Minutes Magazine, The Man, The Myth, and The Manifesto. Content warning. This podcast contains description of murder, discussion on mass murder and terrorism, strong language, and discussion of discrimination against transgender individuals. Listener discretion is advised. What do you get when you mix Harvard, homemade bombs, and a deep-seated fear of technological advancement? A serial killer, or an oversimplification. This is the story of a Harvard graduate, a serial bomber, and the audience that watched him. His name is Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. I'm Jim Williams. And I'm Maya Wilson. And this is... The Man, the Myth, and the Manifesto. December 9th, 1994. It was a Friday. The bomb arrived in an ordinary package on the doorstep of Thomas Mosser's family home in New Jersey. Mosser's wife received the package that day, and she left it on the kitchen table. That night, Friday night, one of their neighbors had a party, and a group of kids wandered over to the Mossers, probably to get away from the adults. One of their daughter's friends, a 13-year-old named Robin, spent the night at their home. The girls were all in the house the next day when the bomb went off in the kitchen. The windows on one side of the house were blown out, shattered, glass scattered across the yard, and in the house, their father was dead. The bombing was horrific, but seemingly random. Why target a hardworking man, a dependable father? The Unabomber chose his targets carefully. University professors, airports, corporate executives, The only pattern? Ted saw his targets as criminals. Criminals who let technology run unchecked, whose actions were destroying the environment and the world. Ted was an intellectual killer, a political killer, and Mosser was a perfect target. Just days earlier, Mosser had been promoted to the general manager of Young and Rubicam, a global marketing agency. The way Ted saw it, Mosser was a criminal. People who lived through the bombings remember them well. They remember the paranoia and anxiety that took over America, its neighborhoods, offices, college campuses, over the 17-year mail bombing campaign. They remember people got their mail scanned for years, terrified to open any mystery parcel. They remember that more than 20 people were injured. Three people were killed. They remember the New York Times headlines. United Airlines chief seriously hurt in blast from package bomb. Four groups investigating. Mystery bomber sent taunting letter to victim at Yale, FBI says. Bombing in New Jersey. The suspect, meticulous in building his bombs, fastidious in remaining at large. And they remember how nothing like it had ever happened before. How even the FBI was stumped. They remember the day the Washington Post published the Unabomber Manifesto the document that spilled the secrets behind it all. 35,000 words, printed as an insert, its own separate leaflet tucked inside the newspaper. September 22, 1995, was an unusually warm day for Cambridge in the fall. It was even more unusual to see a serial killer's manifesto in the Washington Post. And so they might also remember the day the FBI lured him out of his cabin in Montana five months later. 
April 3, 1996. At Harvard, it was an otherwise ordinary spring day, but not for the Unabomber. Once again, on the front page of the papers, but this time without his anonymity, his pen name, and his rambling intellectualism. The Washington Post headline that day read, Unabomber suspect is detained in Montana. No more hiding. Just Theodore J. Kaczynski, class of 62, his scruffy mugshot a pathetic, eerie emblem. In the months to come, his image would return. Ted, pleading guilty, avoiding the death sentence, and receiving eight consecutive life sentences. But what brings him to mind today? That's less obvious. The name might ring a bell, but the details are less clear. You might have seen one of the movies that feature him or listened to a podcast about him. But for some people, seeing Ted in the media sparked more than a passing fascination. It sparked a fixation, a sense of resonance, a movement, a purpose, a figurehead. People have made the Unabomber into many things. Villain, recluse, genius, hero. The complexity of human personalities generally resists such definitions. But the human narrative is all about myth. It embraces myth. Depending on where you stand, where you dive in, you can turn any story into the myth you need it to be. We're always searching for an origin story, to pinpoint the moment a man becomes a murderer. We tell ourselves he's different in some way. Eric L. Benson, who created the Project Unabomb podcast, sums it up perfectly. Like, what, what was it about him? Why him and not us? But that's not exactly the question we're trying to answer here. We're not actually that interested in the Unabomber or Ted himself. We want to get to the bottom of the myth. Ted himself did not respond to a request for comment, but we spoke to the people who have told this story before us. Producers behind the camera, journalists on the ground, publishers who greenlit the manifesto, but also the people who knew Ted. Not as the Unabomber, but as Ted, his classmate, the woman who grew up next to him, his own brother. Why is the Unabomber still lurking in the background of the public imagination 30 years later? What makes this 80-year-old's ideas so exciting for 20-year-old kids on Telegram? And what makes the Unabomber so notorious that modern terrorist groups, eco-fascist and right-wing extremist groups, are still quoting his manifesto? How do we tell stories responsibly, with integrity? How do we cover political violence without contributing to the myth-making? I'm Jim Williams. And I'm Maya Wilson. And this is... The Man, The Myth, and The Manifesto. Listen to the rest at the link in our show notes. Next... Our reporters share faculty opinions on Harvard's Title IX policies and procedures and the controversy surrounding sexual harassment allegations against anthropology professor John L. Comroff. Hi, my name is Rahim Hamid, class of 2025. I'm a FAS administration reporter for the Crimson. I'm Elias Chiskel. I'm also class of 2025 and the other FAS administration reporter. Thank you so much, Elias and Rahim, for joining us today. So we're talking about the Title IX portion of the faculty survey, which you guys are going to be releasing a batch of articles about shortly. Could you give us the rundown of what the faculty survey is? Yeah, absolutely. So each year, the Crimson sends out a survey to all or nearly all of the members of the FAS, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which is Harvard's biggest school, and that also includes the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. This year, they had three weeks to fill out the survey, which contained a range of questions that collected demographic information, opinions on certain political issues, solicited professors' thoughts on several things having to do with the academic culture at Harvard, as well as just life as a professor generally. Um, And so we have those results now, and we're working through the data. Could you tell us a little little bit about the Title IX questions. What topics do they cover this year? This particular year, we do ask questions about John Komaroff, in particular, the embattled anthropology professor. We ask if, if faculty believe he should have been allowed to return to the classroom. He was allowed back in the fall of 2022. We ask what faculty think about Harvard's policies uh, in response to 
sexual harassment and allegations of sexual harassment. We ask about sort of their confidence in the Title IX office and the Office of Dispute Resolution, and then try to get a sense of how, how the respondents think about these certain topics. For sure. For the uninitiated, could we do a 20 to 30 second background on the John Komarov case and why he is embattled right now. So this all started in May 2020 when a reporter for The Crimson published a story that was the result of an eight-month-long investigation that found that three senior anthropology professors had faced complaints of sexual misconduct, one of them being Professor Komarov. Specifically, that story found that three female graduate students in the anthropology department, or at least three, had contacted the Title IX office with complaints about his behavior. In response to that, Harvard launched two internal investigations that ended up finding that Komarov breached Harvard's policy on sexual harassment and professional re- retaliation. And as a result of that, he was placed on a one semester unpaid administrative leave that ended, like Rahim said, in the fall of 2022 when he returned to teaching. Here, just wanted to note that Komarov repeatedly denies all allegations of sexual and professional misconduct. But back to the survey. For a preliminary look at the results, what trends are you noticing among the Faculty of Arts and Sciences this year? Well, I think The biggest statistic that we found this year was that a majority of the faculty who responded to the survey, about 54%, said that they felt as though John Komarov should not have been allowed into the classroom. We've had faculty speak out on this before. There was a high-profile open letter last year. In response to the controversy, 38 members of Harvard's faculty from all, all across the university published a letter saying that they were concerned about the investigation into Komarov and how it was being handled. In response, Claudine Gay, now president-elect and currently FAS dean, published a response to that and sort of essentially said that faculty who are writing this letter don't have all the information. So a few days after the 38 professors released the open letter, three anthropology PhD candidates filed a federal lawsuit against Harvard, alleging that the university ignored years of sexual harassment and retaliation complaints against Komarov. And on that same day, a group of 73 faculty sent a response letter to those 38. Essentially condemning the letter that the 38 faculty members sent in support of Komarov. And then 35, if not more, of those 38 faculty withdrew their signatures. This dialogue has been happening at a high level for a long time. Yeah, there was also a call from 15 Harvard anthropology professors who called on Komarov to resign. That included the former chair of the anthropology department, Ajantha Subramanian, who spoke to us recently on the record, blasting Harvard's response to the whole to the whole ordeal and saying that it was um, pretty inadequate. So, you know, there have been public statements from professors about this, but I think this is our first sense that a majority of the faculty also feel this way and feel as though uh, Professor Komarov shouldn't be allowed back into the classroom, that he shouldn't be a part of the campus teaching community. And so I think that's, you know, really notable. It sounds like then that the Komarov controversy is at the heart of the Title IX questions in the faculty survey this year. I wonder if there are other topics as well that the questions cover? Yeah, so Komarov is not the the bulk of the survey. It's uh, certainly a part of it. And I think a lot of faculty are thinking about it, although I mean, I don't want to speak for them. But the faculty are also asked about their opinions on the ODR, the Office of Dispute Resolution, and sort of their, their confidence in that their opinion of Harvard's Title IX policies and, the, and their faith in the Title IX office. And oh, we also asked them if they're comfortable a- answering if they know someone in their department who was ever sexually harassed or if they themselves were ever sexually harassed. Those numbers are pretty much in track with what they were last year. So last year, around 8% of respondents of the survey said that they were sexually harassed. This year, I believe it's around 7.2%. Our survey got, I think, 386 respondents uh, out of th- the 1,300 that we sent it to. 31% said they knew somebody who who had experienced sexual harassment, which is actually an increase from what we found last year, which was that 26% of survey faculty were in this position. I, w- I, w- I wouldn't um, draw any too firm conclusions from, you know, just a one-year variation in the results, but, you know, it is interesting to note. So thank you so much then for that recap. I wonder if there are additional trends that you're watching out for. Maybe they're still emerging this year, but ones that are of note. To be honest, I think with a lot of the questions. So, so some of these questions do uh, say the same year to year. For instance, the question about, do you know someone in your department who's been sexually harassed? I think the tricky thing with the faculty survey is that, I mean, sort of like it's, it's statistical significance, right? And the significance of each question varies sort of question to question. And so it's hard to sort of draw definitive conclusions about someone sort of being likely to do something or less likely to sort of respond a certain way de- based on demographic, de- demographic data, for instance. And so the, the best that we can do is sort of say X percent of respondents said such and such and sort of leave it to the reader to determine. We publish our methodology in our articles, so that's we're very transparent about that. But I think it's hard to sort of say that there are these definitive trends, especially with only a one a year-to-year 
comparison. I think one thing that we break like to break down by is the division for some of these questions. And again, I want to reiterate that it's it's impossible to sort of say that like if you're in this division, you are likelier to know someone who was sexually harassed in your department. So it's not you can't say that. But for the past two years now, this year and last year, and I'm not sure about the years prior, the social sciences division has had the highest percentage of faculty who have said they know someone who is sexually harassed in their department compared to other divisions, so arts and humanities or FAS sciences or Cs. Again, you can't draw any conclusions from that. You can't say, oh, you're likelier to know someone who was sexually harassed in your department if you're in the social sciences division, but it is something that has happened, like that we've seen in both this year and last year. I, I wonder if As you're looking to other parts of the faculty survey this year, where Title IX fits in relation to the other types of questions that you're asking, what how does this all fit into the larger narrative of the faculty survey here? We ask questions about basically everything when we do this survey. Yeah, a really wide range of topics. Title IX is one component of that. Title IX is an important enough component, and we ask enough questions about it that it merits sort of a, a look into the into the specific questions. But we look at sort of faculty's political affiliations and how faculty feel about political political issues, and we ask faculty about academic issues, and we ask faculty about life as a professor here at, at the university or life as a non-tenure track faculty member at the university. So Title IX is just one component of many, many questions that we ask. Yeah, I'll just say some other topics that I think are of interest. We ask about faculty's opinion on President Bacco and his tenure, President Gay, and I think we've added in some questions now that President Gay will be assuming the role of the Harvard presidency, and there will be a successor in place to take over as the dean of FAS. So we solicit opinions on that. We also ask about AI with the rise of ChatGBT and how that's affecting professors and faculty's experience teaching um, and doing their research and so on. Definitely Title IX is one important component, but it's a, it's a really wide-ranging survey. News Talk is hosted by Frank S. Zoe. Our producers are Gina H. Cho and Frank S. Zoe. Our multimedia chairs are Joey Huang and Julian J. Giordano. Our managing editor is Brandon L. Kingdollar, with edits from associate managing editor Mei Mei Xu. Music in this episode comes from freesound.org. And an original score by Benji Wall Fang. From 14 Plimpton Street, this is News Talk.